Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I'm Dr. Medora Dias from Goa Medical College. I'm presenting the topic for today, General Anatomy of the Muscle. The clinically relevant topics for today are poliomyelitis, muscle tears and injury, muscle sprains and myasthenia gravis, among others. What is muscle? In Latin, mus means a mouse. Muscles resemble a mouse with the belly being the body and the tail of the mouse being the tendon. It's a contractile tissue made up of cells called myocytes and these cells shorten by contraction and they are lengthened in one direction wherein they are called muscle fibers. We could classify muscles into different types. If you see in this figure here, skeletal muscle forms muscles of the skeleton of the body. There is cardiac muscle found in the heart and smooth muscle found in the gastrointestinal tract. Coming to skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is striated muscle. It has striations across its length. It's multinucleated and forms half of the body weight. It is supplied by the somatic nervous system. It is also called striped muscle, striated muscle, somatic muscle or voluntary muscle. Next is the smooth muscle, you can see here, made of fusiform fibers present in the walls of ducts, walls of blood vessels, genital systems, cardiovascular, the digestive systems and the urinary genital systems. There are no transversations and is supplied by the autonomic nervous system. Cardiac muscle, this is present in heart and it is also striated but branched having intercalated discs, it's involuntary, totally under the autonomic nervous system. If we compare the three types of muscle, skeletal, smooth and cardiac, we see where they lie. Skeletal muscle lies in the body skeleton as well as in places like the tongue, pharynx and esophagus. Smooth muscle lies also in the esophagus, the iris, gastrointestinal tracts, genitourinary tracts and blood vessels. Cardiac muscle lies only in the heart walls. The structure in skeletal, they are long and cylindrical, whereas in smooth muscle they are spindle shaped. In cardiac they are short and cylindrical. Branching pattern in skeletal and smooth, they are unbranched, whereas in cardiac they branch. Multinucleated in skeletal, uninucleated in both smooth as well as cardiac. The banding pattern is seen in skeletal and cardiac but not seen in the smooth muscle. Intercalated discs are present only in the cardiac muscle and not in skeletal or smooth muscle. The nervous supply is from the autonomic nervous system for both cardiac and smooth but not for skeletal. Blood supply is less in the smooth muscle and more in the other two types. Contractions are rapid in skeletal, slow in smooth and rapid again in cardiac. Cardiac muscle never gets fatigued because it lies in the heart, whereas smooth muscle gets fatigued very, very late, whereas skeletal muscle gets fatigued immediately. Skeletal muscle is also voluntary, whereas the other two types are involuntary. Coming to the parts of skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle has two ends, we say origin and insertion. If you look at your arm, origin and insertion, the origin is supposed to be the part of the muscle that remains more fixed and insertion is supposed to be the part of the muscle which moves. Now these terms are interchangeable. The origin and the insertion could be interchangeable depending on which part is fixed and which part is moving. Parts of skeletal muscle could be divided into the fleshy part being the belly and the fibrous or the tendinous part 
sometimes expanded to form an aponeurosis. Tendons are stronger than the bellies and if there ever is an injury of a muscle, it's usually the belly that will rupture rather than the tendon. How do we break up skeletal muscle into smaller elements? So we have the full muscle as you can see in this figure here. And this full muscle is made up of bundles of smaller groups of fibers. These are called fasciculi. Each fasciculus is made up of one muscle fiber. A muscle fiber is also called a myocyte or a muscle cell. Each muscle cell is made up of many myofibrils and one myofibril is made up of many myofilaments. So here we have broken down muscle into a full muscle, fasciculi, a fiber, myofibrils and myofilaments. In muscle, the cytoplasm is called sarcoplasm and the plasma membrane is called the sarcolemma. In skeletal muscle, the sarcoplasm has several hundred nuclei and they are peripherally placed under the sarcolemma. Myofibrils have alternate light and dark bands stretching across them as seen in polarized light microscopy as the A band or the dark band and the I band or the isotropic band or the light band. The H band is in the center of an A band. The Z line is in the center of an I band. These bands are basically made up of regularly arranged myofilaments, the thick filaments, the actin filaments, and the thin filaments, the myosin filaments. The actin and myosin filaments are slightly overlapping each other. During contraction, they overlap more. During relaxation, they go back to their original state. In this manner, a muscle can contract and shorten, or it can relax and lengthen. The successive part between two consecutive Z lines is called a sarcomere. This sarcomere is the structural unit of a muscle fiber and is defined as being the part of a myofibril between two consecutive Z bands. So we have two consecutive Z bands and the part of the myofibril between this is called the sarcomere. What is the connective tissue that is supporting muscle? There is an outer covering called the epimysium. This covers the entire muscle and it is tough and collagenous in nature. Then each fascicle is in turn covered by a perimysium. Each fiber is covered by a very delicate endomysium. So you have epimysium, a perimysium and a smaller covering called an endomysium. What is the function for all this connective tissue? First of all, it will prevent excessive stretching of the muscle, especially in the relaxed state. Secondly, it constitutes pathways for the nerves, the blood vessels and the lymphatics to pass to the muscle. Thirdly, and most importantly, it transmits the forces generated by the muscle through its tendon to bones. What is the relationship between muscle and tendon? At the myotendinal junction, so this junction between muscle, myo and tendon, forces get transmitted from the muscle fiber through the endomysium to the tendon and then to the bone. Always remember, tendons are twice as strong as muscles. So, when there is strain thrown on a muscle, what is going to rupture is not the tendon but the belly or the myotendinous junction could tear or the tendon could pull out a piece of bone with it. Let's come to fiber types in skeletal muscle. You see this picture here. What does it show you? There is a sprinter on one side. Who is a sprinter? A fast runner. And on the other side you see a marathon runner. Now amongst these two, who would you think requires longer lasting muscles with longer lasting energy levels? Definitely a marathon runner. 
So marathon runners have muscles that should not fatigue easily, whereas a sprinter needs muscles that will act fast and may get fatigued easier. So you have type 1 slow twitch fibers like gluteus maximus. They are red in color because they have a large amount of myoglobin in them. These are seen more in the marathon runners and they are highly resistant to fatigue. On the other hand, you have type 2 fast twitch fibers seen mostly in the sprinter muscles. They are paler and white because they have small amounts of myoglobin. You also get an intermediate type of fiber which is a type 2 fast fiber but not so fatigable. And normally muscles are not only red or only white but a combination of red and white fibers. Some having more red and some having more white. So we compare in this table the red type 1 fibers to the pale type 2 fibers. Diameter wise small and large, blood supply is rich and poor. Nerve supply here in type 1 there are smaller nerve fibers, in type 2 you have larger nerve fibers. These are slow twitch that is your type 1 whereas type 2 are fast twitch. Forces of contraction also variable from weak to strong. These fatigue later and the type 2 fatigue easier. To summarize, we are talking about muscle. Muscle is made up of cells called myocytes which are elongated in one direction calling them muscle fibers. We classified muscle into three types, a skeletal, a smooth and cardiac muscle. We discussed the ends of skeletal muscle being origin which is more fixed and insertion which is more movable. Two parts of a muscle, the fleshy part which is called the belly and the fibrous part which could be a tendon or an aponeurosis. We broke down muscle into smaller components saying that each muscle is made up of groups called fasciculi further broken down into fibers, cells or myocytes, each having myofibrils and each myofibril having regularly arranged myofilaments. We discussed connective tissue coverings like epimysium, perimysium and endomysium respectively covering the entire muscle, the fasciculi and individual muscle fibers. Types of fibers we discussed, type 1 slow twitch fibers, type 2 fast twitch fibers and of course the intermediate type of fibers like type 2 but less fatigable. Now let's start talking about the architecture and the structure of skeletal muscle. If we talk about the arrangement of fasciculi, arrangement of fasciculi could be parallel, they could be oblique or they could be spiral. Accordingly, parallel fibers are further divided into different types. If you look at the force of movement required by muscle, the force of movement will always be proportionate to the number and the size of muscle fibers. If you want to talk about range of movement, how much a joint can have a range of movement? That depends totally on the length of the fibers. So muscles could be classified on their arrangement of fasciculi into parallel fasciculi oblique fasciculi and spiral fasciculi. So here you see parallel fibers parallel to each other. These are oblique to the long axis of the muscle and then here you have spirally arranged muscle. Parallel fasciculi are further divided on their shape into quadrilateral like thyrohyoid, strap like like sternohyoid and sartorius strap like with intersections in between like the rectus abdominis of the anterior abdominal wall or they could be fusiform like the heads of biceps or the digastric muscle. Oblique fasciculi, now these are going to be more powerful muscles because more muscle fibers get packed in and they assume a pennate feather like appearance. Again classified into triangular like this. Examples being the temporalis muscle 
of mastication and the adductor longus of the thigh. Then there could be unipennate which is fibers running in one direction to a tendinous attachment like flexor pollicis longus of the forearm or extensor digitorum longus or peroneus tertius of the foot and palmar interosseae. Then there is bipennate, so you see fibers coming from both sides and inserting into a long tendon here. This kind of arrangement is found in rectus femoris of the thigh and many other muscles as mentioned. Multipennate, here this becomes most powerfully packed with lot of fibers going to tendinous intersections here and the example of a multipennate which everyone knows about is the large deltoid muscle of the shoulder especially the acromial fibers. There is another type of penation called circumpennate seen in the leg tibialis anterior muscle. Spiral or twisted fasciculi, here the example is the trapezius muscle, also the pectoralis major latissimus dorsi where fibers get twisted. Sometimes the fasciculi even get crossed like you see here. This is the sternocleidomastoid where the fascicles cross each other. So you have the cleidofibers and the sternal fibers here. A big question comes up to your mind now is how do we name muscles? Now muscles have various names, some more complicated than others, but there are certain features which are used to classify muscles based on certain structures like according to their shape, their size, the number of heads they have, their attachment, how deep they lie, what is their structure, what is their position and what is their action. So any of these features can be used to name a muscle. Let us explain as we go on further. Naming the muscles by shape. The deltoid, what does this mean? It means a triangle. So the deltoid is a triangular muscle. If you take the rhomboidus muscle of the back, that is diamond shaped, rhomboid means diamond shaped. Teres major, if you see here, this is the teres major. If you look at this muscle, it is a rounded muscle, teres means round. If you look at the lumbrical muscles of the hand, they are very slender and worm like and so they are called lumbricals. Naming the muscles and shape. We continue with quadratus femoris which is a quadrangular muscle as you see the shape. Gracilis if you see on the inner aspect of thigh is slender and hence the name. Rectus abdominis is straight, rectus means straight. So we have now seen how muscles could be named based on their shape. The next feature is size. Is the muscle large or small? So pectoralis major and minor. This will be two muscles, large or small. Latissimus dorsi, so that is the latissimus dorsi here. It is a broad muscle seen in the back. It is the broadest and hence is called latissimus. Longissimus thoracis, longissimus would mean longest. Adductor longus would mean long. Adductor brevis would be much shorter. Naming the muscles based on number of heads, a muscle could have two heads where it is called biceps, three heads where it is called triceps or four heads where it is called the quadriceps. In this figure we see here a two headed muscle called the biceps brachii, a three headed muscle called the triceps brachii and here we see the digastric muscle, di meaning two, gaster meaning belly, the two bellied muscle. Naming the muscles by attachment, so we have sternocleidomastoid, why is it called sternocleidomastoid? Mastoid is the mastoid process where it is attached above, sternal fibers and clavicular fibers, cledo stands for clavicle, so sternocleidomastoid and that is how we name this muscle. Another example is the brachialis which lies in the arm and so it is called the brachialis. Naming the muscles based on how deep they lie. For example, in the forearm there are two muscles which are both flexor digitorum. 
but one is superficially placed and the next one is under that or deeply placed. So flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. In the same way, in the anterior abdominal wall, there is obliquus externus or rather commonly known as external oblique and there is obliquus internus or commonly known as the internal oblique. Both muscles like sheaths lying one inner to the other. Externus definitely would be on the outer side, internus would be on the inner side. And so now muscles can now be named based on how deep they lie. So superficial or profundus, externus or internus. Naming muscles based on their structure. Here we see this muscle having digitations like a saw-toothed serrate appearance. So this muscle is aptly called serratus anterior, meaning serrated edge. Similarly, there is a muscle called a semitendinosus in the posterior side of thigh. It is half muscle, half tendon and hence the name. Naming muscles based on their position, where they lie in the body. For example, anteriorly placed tibialis anterior, posteriorly placed tibialis posterior, laterally placed vastus lateralis, medially placed vastus medialis. So similarly we have superior and inferior, superior rectus, inferior rectus, supra or infra, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, dorsi of the back, latissimus dorsi, brachii of the arm, biceps brachii, femoris of the thigh, rectus femoris, oris of the mouth, orbicularis oris, or of the eye, orbiculus oculi. So this is how we name muscles based on their position. So that's your orbicularis oculi, orbicularis oris, the biceps brachii of the arm, rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, here tibialis anterior, tibialis posterior and that is your vastus medialis. So here you get an idea that the position of the muscle where it is placed in the body would determine the nomenclature for the muscle. The last feature that is used for naming muscles is the action produced by the respective muscle. For example, the extensor so this increases the angle between forearm and palm, extensor pollicis longus or it could be a flexor, flexor pollicis longus, abductor or adductor either taking away or towards the midline, levator or depressor to elevate or pull down like levator scapulae or depressor anguli oris, a supinator turning the palm anteriorly or a pronator turning the palm posteriorly. So supinator is a supinator of the elbow, pronator is pronator teres. Constrictor and dilator like the pupillary muscles, constrictor pupillae or dilator pupillae. There could also be muscles causing abduction of digits. These are called the dorsal interossei. Let's summarize what we have done so far. So we have talked about classifying muscles based on their fascicular arrangement or naming of muscles depending on various features used. The fascicular arrangement could be parallel, oblique or spiral and the various features used in naming muscles depending on their shape or their size, the number of heads they have, their attachment, how deep they lie, the structure, their position and lastly the actions they produce. Let's study about the nerve supply to skeletal muscle. All muscles are supplied by nerves. In skeletal muscle, there is a motor nerve. Now the motor nerve has 60% of motor fibers and 40% of sensory fibers. So that's more motor fibers than there are sensory fibers. The motor fibers have different types of efferents. There are the large myelinated alpha efferents, the smaller myelinated gamma efferents, 
which uh, relate to the muscle spindles and then the fine non-myelinated autonomic efferents which supply smooth muscle of the blood vessels. The sensory fibers which make up 40 percent are the myelinated fibers to muscle spindles and tendon for proprioception. Here we see the spinal cord and the nerve we see here in green. This is the sensory nerve, that is the posterior horn and that is the anterior root here with the anterior horn. This is the motor nerve and that is the sensory nerve and this component that we see here is the muscle spindle. What is this muscle spindle? It is a spindle shaped sensory organ hence the name. It contains intrafusal muscle fibers of two types large nuclear bag fibers and small nuclear chain fibers which are innervated by both the sensory as well as the motor nerves. Sensory endings are of two types the primary annulospiral and the secondary flower spray endings. The muscle spindle acts as a stretch receptor to regulate the degree and rate of contraction of extrafusal fibers by influencing the alpha neurons. What is the motor point? It is the point of the muscle where a motor nerve enters and it is the point of maximal electrical stimulation giving maximum effect. Motor units could be divided into small motor units and larger motor units. Accordingly, we have a small motor unit 5 to 10 fibers found in muscles for fine movement like muscles of the eye or larger motor units made up of 100 to 2000 fibers found in muscles for gross movements like the proximal limb muscles. There can always be a composite muscle or a hybrid muscle. Now a composite or hybrid muscle has nerve supply from two different motor nerves with different root values. For example, the adductor magnus of the medial compartment of thigh, it has an adductor part so that will be supplied by the obturator nerve having a root value of L2, L3 and L4. Whereas the hamstring part of adductor magnus is supplied by the sciatic nerve having a different root value L4, L5, S1, S2 and S3. So here we see one muscle having developmentally derived parts from two different parts the adductor part and the hamstring part. And so they are going to be supplied by two different nerve components having two different root values. Coming to nerve supply of smooth muscle, there's two types of nerve supply of the smooth muscle. This is the single unit type wherein there are less nerve fibers than muscle cells like in the intestines. The nerve impulses reaches one fiber of muscle and this is transmitted to the next fiber by pull. So here you find the feature nerve supply is sparse, there is less nerve supply. If you look at the multi-unit type, in the multi-unit type again in the eye, you need precise movements and you have more number of nerve fibers or more number of neurons than the number of muscle cells. So here there is a rich nerve supply and each muscle cell receives a separate nerve fiber. So contraction is simultaneous and very fast and very precise and that is exactly what we need from the eye muscles. What about the cardiac muscle? Cardiac muscle it is supplied by the autonomic nervous system sympathetic and parasympathetic. What does the sympathetic do? It stimulates the heart rate, increases the blood pressure, dilates coronary arteries and carries sensory fibers of pain from the heart. What do the parasympathetics do? They decrease and reduce the heart rate. Sensory fibers here are involved with visceral reflexes. Let's study actions of muscle. So everyone knows what does a muscle do? It contracts. So contraction is the prime action of a muscle. The belly shortens by almost 30 percent giving you movement. Range depends on length of the fibers, power depends on number of the fibers. If you look here at a relaxed muscle, you see it is much longer. 
Whereas if you look at a contracted state, the muscle would definitely be shorter. Contraction is of three ways. Reflex contraction, for example, the diaphragm, when we breathe, are we telling our diaphragm to contract? No. So these are automatic, involuntary movements like the respiratory movements of the diaphragm. This is called reflexive contraction. Then there is tonic contraction, slight contraction, but there is no movement. It gives the muscle a type of firmness. The third type is what we understand easily being phasic contraction. This is further classified into two types, isometric and isotonic. Isotonic is further classified into two types, concentric and eccentric. Let's study some details about the phasic type of contraction. Isometric contraction is a contraction wherein the length of the muscle is unchanged. Iso meaning unchanged and metric meaning length. Isotonic contraction is where the tone remains constant and doesn't change, which is further divided into two types, concentric and eccentric. In concentric, the tension increases as the muscle contracts and shortens. Whereas in eccentric, the muscle length increases. Concentric would be like going to a gym and picking up your dumbbell and flexing your elbow joint. Eccentric would be the opposite movement of trying to put your dumbbell back on the bench and lengthening your biceps muscles. Now how do muscles and bones and joints work together? So we have muscles, there are bones and there are joints and all of them have to work in unison to produce movements of the body. If you look here, we see a bar and a small little triangle which is called the fulcrum. So the fulcrum is a balancing part or the balancing point on which this bar like a seesaw could move up or down. At one end is the load at the other end is the effort of the muscle. So this is the bone, the muscle action, the action of the weight on the body and the fulcrum is at the joint. So bones and joints as well as muscles form a system of levers on the body. The muscle applies a force or the effort, the joint acts as the fulcrum and the bone acts as a lever and bears the weight of the body part to be moved. Levers could be divided into first class, second class or third class levers. Most of our muscles in the body belong to the third class lever type. Let's further go into details of different types of levers. The lever systems, so the first class lever we have a fulcrum in the center the effort on one side, which is the action of the muscles here, and the load of the weight of the skull acting with the force of gravity downwards resembles a scissors if you think about the two ends here cutting the object being the force and the fulcrum where the two blades meet. The effort applied is your fingers moving the handles of the scissors. This is a first class lever. Moving on to a second class lever system, again the fulcrum is at one end here and we have the force acting downwards, that is the weight of the body and the effort is the muscle contraction moving the heel upwards. Resembling the wheelbarrow lifting of a wheelbarrow, you lift the handles up, that's your effort, the load acting of the weight of the wheelbarrow downwards and the fulcrum being at the wheel. The third class lever is an example of the knee joint. If you look at the knee joint, that's your fulcrum at the knee joint. This is your effort being the hamstring muscle contracting in an upward direction and the load is downwards. So the load is at one end, the effort in the middle and the fulcrum at the other end. Most of the joints in the body belong to this third class lever systems. When we talk about movements at any joint, we have to understand that sometimes it's not just an individual muscle acting, 
but there are groups of muscle acting at any joint at any given point of time. So, we have prime movers. The prime muscle moving any joint, for example here, the biceps or the brachialis, it's a prime mover. It's an agonist. It's the chief prime muscle of a joint which initiates and maintains a movement like the brachialis of the elbow joint. Always remember there is something called action of paradox where a prime mover helps in the opposite action like for example you want to keep this block back on the table. Pink, picking up the block is a prime mover action but keeping it back on the table is action of paradox where there is eccentric paradoxical contraction of the prime mover to do the opposite action. What is an antagonist? An antagonist is an opposer. It will do the opposite of the prime mover. It opposes the prime mover and it is required to prevent jerky movements of a prime mover. It helps smooth precise movements by controlled relaxation of the antagonistic muscles. And they have a common innovation if you look at this figure here. The agonist of the knee joint and the antagonist. They have common nerve supply and this common feedback is what allows proper coordination between the agonists and the antagonists for smooth joint control. Fixators. This is a third type of group of muscles which fixes a joint in order to give other finer movements. For example, if you take the shoulder joint Muscles which can fix the shoulder joint like trapezius and deltoid. If the shoulder joint is fixed and stabilized, that means there can be better precise movements at the elbow joint. So these muscles are called fixators. Then we come to synergists. Synergists is not very difficult to understand. It's basically a muscle, one muscle cannot create a desired movement. So a desired movement is created by two or more muscles. So when a muscle, a prime mover crosses more than one joint, you could have an undesired action of that muscle on another joint. This is controlled by a synergist. Like for example, you want to make a fist. Now when you want to make a tight fist, the wrist has to be slightly in extension. So you have the prime movers being the flexing and the synergist being the extensors of the wrist joint to allow your fingers to clasp. So the extensors of the wrist joint become the synergists in an action of making a fist, a tight fist. Next we study spurt and shunt actions of muscles. What is a spurt action and what is a shunt action? Or rather we say a spurt muscle and a shunt muscle. A spurt action acts across the bone and the point of insertion swings through an arc whereas a shunt muscle acts along the bone and forces the two articulating surfaces together like in this brachioradialis is going to pull the forearm bones towards the humerus and bring bone against bone. This is called shunt action. Whereas this is a spurt action of biceps or even the brachialis. So in the elbow flexors, biceps and brachialis are spurt muscles. Whereas brachioradialis is a shunt muscle. So I think the concept of spurt and shunt can easily be understood by the examples of brachialis, biceps and the brachioradialis. To summarize, we talked about nerve supply of the skeletal muscle, the motor nerve having more motor fibers and fewer sensory fibers. We spoke about a motor unit comprising of a muscle spindle and we also spoke about the composite hybrid muscle like adductor magnus. Smooth muscle nerve supply we said multi-unit or single unit type. In cardiac muscle we spoke about sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve supply. Then we moved on to actions of muscles. What is contraction and how it is divided into different types, isotonic, isometric, 
eccentric and concentric types. We also studied agonistic muscles and antagonists and how they work together, the faction of paradox of agonists, synergists, how they function as well as fixators. Last we did spurt and shunt muscles and how they act giving an example of the elbow joint muscles. Clinical anatomy of muscle. How do you test a muscle? It is very important to understand how to test a muscle. Muscle could be tested for power grades 0 to 5. Grade 0 would be a muscle totally paralyzed having no movement at all. Grade 1, grade 1 would be muscle having a flicker of movement. Grade 2 would mean a muscle that cannot act against gravity. Grade 3 would be a muscle that could act against gravity. 4 would be against resistance and only grade 5 would be normal power against full resistance offered by the examiner. So how do we examine muscles? The examiner examines muscles because he can determine which nerve is injured depending on which, which muscle is paralyzed. The examiner provides resistance to the muscle and the person has to resist this and provide the movement. For example, testing arm abduction. The examiner would push the arm downwards whereas the patient would have to abduct the arm against the examiner's resistance. Electromyography can be another method of testing muscle activity. Electrodes are placed on the respective muscles and another electrode for the movement produced. These are connected to a machine and this can be used clinically to assess integrity of muscles as well as the nerves that are supplying them. Compartment syndrome, sometimes in the limbs, fascia separates muscles into isolated compartments and each compartment has blood supply and nerves. Damage to the muscles in these compartments could cause inflammation and fluid leakage, giving you a tightening of pressure in this compartment, leading to compression of the nerves. Here is an example that I showed you a picture of earlier. A case of poliomyelitis wherein there is paralysis, lower motor neuron damage, paralysis, flaccid paralysis with loss of tendon jerks. You could also get upper motor neuron paralysis like in a person who has had a cerebral stroke or any trauma to the brain or spinal cord. Myopathy is an inherent disease of any muscle. Muscle spasms, these are cramp-like pains, localized spasms in the muscle and you need to relax the muscle in order to relieve the pain. On the other hand, epilepsy and tetanus are also muscle spasms but they are more generalized and they involve more muscle groups of the body. What is denervation and degeneration of a muscle? When a nerve to a muscle is severed or injured or interrupted, the muscle fiber degenerates. This muscle fiber gets replaced by fibrous tissue and scar formation. There could be regeneration but this would be if there is nerve supply back in 12 months beyond which muscle fiber will totally degenerate and it is irreversible after a year. Coming to muscle injuries and tears, in the first one you see a grade 1 injury. It's just a contusion on a muscle and it will heal on its own. In grade 2, there's a partial thickness tear, whereas grade 3 is very severe because here you see the entire muscle belly has disrupted. So, I spoke about the strength of a tendon and the strength of a muscle belly. If you remember, we said muscle bellies are not as strong as tendons and when any strain is thrown on a muscle, it's more probable that the muscle belly will tear rather than the tendon tearing. So always keep this in mind with muscle injuries. Disuse atrophy and hypertrophy. When a muscle is not used, for example, a patient having a stroke, he might recover after six months. But in the six months of the recovery from a stroke, his muscles are not being used. Any muscle not being used goes into what we call 
disuse a trophy and disuse a trophy will proceed and what you get is if you look at a normal muscle here you get an atrophied muscle the fibers have undergone atrophy it's become smaller than usual and this muscle will not work as well as it worked before hypertrophy on the other hand is a muscle that increases more than its normal size and this can occur with exercise or excessive use hyperplasia on the other hand is a term you should understand it is an increase in the number of fibers like for example in the uterus in pregnancy in order to accommodate the fetus the number of fibers in the uterus increases so hypertrophy in hypertrophy a muscle increases in size in hyperplasia you have more number of cells myasthenia gravis this is an autoimmune disease where antibodies are produced and they do not allow the receptors to work well so nerve impulse transmission is blocked leading to muscle weakness like you see here in this diagram there is ptosis or a drooping upper eyelid this is the affected side compare it to the normal side extraocular muscles are most commonly affected you'll find the person turning his head backwards to look forwards otherwise his eyelids tend to droop seen more in females and the age around 20 to 40 years polymyositis is inflammation of muscle fibers the wbc's invade them and it affects mostly muscles close to the trunk or the torso intramuscular injection sites intramuscular injections are a very common feature we need to know which are the muscles in this body can be used for these sites so you have rectus femoris here and that would be your injection site or the vastus lateralis which could also be used for muscular injections in cardiac muscle there could be something like fibrillation where there is abnormal contraction or disruption of pumping of the heart muscle angina pectoris is pain due to ischemia of the cardiac muscle is relieved by rest if it gets more severe it leads to what we call a heart attack myocardial ischemia is persistent ischemia due to blockage of most probably a main artery and pain is not relieved by rest because there is necrosis of the cardiac muscle fibers this leads to pain along the left arm chest and the neighboring areas we summarize whatever we have done for today so far contractile tissue made up of myocytes its muscle fiber we broke down muscle fiber into its respective smaller bits types of muscle we said skeletal smooth and cardiac skeletal muscle having two ends origin which is fixed insertion which is movable two parts the fleshy belly or the fibrous tendon or aponeurosis we broke down muscle into fasciculi further broken down into fibers or cells cells are made up of regularly arranged myofibrils which are in turn made up of regularly arranged myofilaments actin and myosin coverings of muscle epimysium covering the full muscle perimysium covering the fascicles endomysium covering a single muscle fiber we spoke about type 1 slow fibers type 2 fast twitch and the intermediate fibers at any given point of time a muscle has a combination of type 1 and type 2 fibers depending on the type of muscle required fasciculi architecturally could be divided into parallel oblique or spiral fibers then we came to a huge part of how do you name muscles we have studied how to name muscles based on their shape or size or the number of heads they have or their attachment or how deep they lie what is their structure what is their position and of course all the actions that they can produce nerve supply of skeletal muscle we spoke about the motor nerve what is a motor unit what is a muscle spindle in smooth muscle we studied single unit and multi unit nerve supply in cardiac muscle we saw the autonomic nerve supply sympathetic and parasympathetic 
When we studied actions of muscles, we studied types of contraction, isotonic, isometric, eccentric and concentric. We also talked about agonist muscles, antagonist muscles, synergists and fixators. We also had a small uh, topic on spurt and shunt muscles and how they act on the same joint. Clinically in anatomy of this topic, we studied about muscle testing, what is electromyography, what are the different types of muscle injuries and tears, paralysis, how a muscle can atrophy, how it could regenerate and what is hyperplasia, an autoimmune disease like myasthenia gravis which affects muscles and last we talked about myocardial ischemia types. With this I end my topic, thank you.